Today on the Accidental Talmudist podcast, we had author and podcast host Douglas Rushkoff, who is a big New York intellectual who's also funny and marvelously original in all his thinking. We, we had quite a spirited debate on a number of issues. Uh, number one, is social media a tool that's moving us forward in history, helping us evolve? Or is it a bomb that is going off in slow motion and we don't realize it, but it's taking us down in flames? What is the correct way to regulate this social media bomb? Uh, how does it fit into a world of, of morality and moral law? How does God and social media intersect, interact, abut? Are they disjunct? I mean, what is a person of faith to do confronted with the trolls of social media? Um, and what does all of this have to do with civics? Civics is this word that we never hear anymore in American public life, but may be the missing puzzle piece that will save us. Accidental Talmudist wisdom you don't want to miss Ancient light that shines on today All his life he'd break the rules Cause he never had the tools Till the Talmud grabbed him that great day Showed him the way Accidental Talmudist wisdom you don't want to miss Now my pal Sal, take it away All right, welcome to the Accidental Talmudist podcast Today, we have a great privilege uh, to have Douglas Rushkoff, author and host uh, of Team Human, the book and the podcast, as well as quite a large number of other books. You, uh, you've got that talent, Douglas, not only for writing good books, but for writing. A lot, uh, of, a lot of book, you know, a lot of authors can be good, don't put out that much stuff. You get it done. Uh, yeah, well, it's the main thing I do, so... <laughs> you know, if it's what you do, and then you end up doing it. <laughs> well, you know, it's a question. Do you love doing it? Do you love writing? Yeah, when I have something to say. Yeah, and parts of it, and parts of it are really hard and lonely. You know, you basically have to be alone for a year to write a book. And then to release a book, you've got to be in more crowds for two or three months than you ever want to see in your life. So, um, it's a so very you, uh, so just when you get sick of writing, you got to join the people, and when you get sick of the people, it's time to write another. Go book. back, yeah, but it's a little bulimic though. I'm, uh, I'm actually, I'm, I'm thinking of Team Human as my last book. You know, the last of it's like twenty books I've written. That's as much as anybody should be allowed to write, much less you know, uh, paid to write. And uh, I want to try to find a, a little more balance, kind of uh, practice a bit more of what I'm preaching in terms of work, life, uh, online, offline, uh, you know, uh, uh, productive versus uh, uh, just engaged life. What is, do you have a family? What's your family situation? Yeah, I've got a wife and a 14-year-old daughter. And, uh, you know, real life, they've got all their real life stuff and challenges. And so it's hard on them either way. Either you're home all the time. <laughs> which yeah, is well, they don't live right <laughs> in, our, in our little town. But um, yeah, either I'm, I'm, but I'm, when I'm writing a book, I'm slightly distracted all the time. Everything okay. is grist for the mill and I'm sort of in there. Or I'm, yeah, I've just been, I was just in Portland for three days and England for four or five days before that. And, San Francisco for the week before that. So it's been, uh, that's hard on them, you know? Right. Yeah. I mean, I have it the same. My wife and I are a screenwriting team. Uh, when we're releasing a movie, I'm on the road a lot. When we're writing, and our office is in our garage. So the commute is just over to the garage. Uh -huh. so we're around a lot. Yeah. <laughs> so the kids have their own complaints about that. But let's talk about Team Human a little bit. I thought actually I'd just start with a quote so we could get right into it. Um, and well, yeah, let's just start with a quote, and, and then I'll ask you some more general questions about the book, because, I mean, this is really fascinating. The, the, the concept is, I would say, uh, that every human is part of a kind of mega-organism, uh, which is the human race, and we forget those linkages at our peril, both as individuals and as a species. Um, so you say right at the top of the book, that we're in a predicament, right? And there's a reason for our current predicament. 
an anti-human agenda embedded in our technology, our markets, and our major cult cultural institutions, from education and religion to civics and media, it has turned them from forces for human connection and expression into ones of isolation and repression. So Douglas, I mean, are you really viewing us as being on the brink uh, of, of, of a catastrophe? Oh, we could be if we certainly didn't, don't, you know, change direction drastically in the next few years. Well, yeah, I mean, because I mean, I think the climate scientists are correct. I think the the uh, epidemic of both, you know, prescription uh, antidepressants and, you know, uh, black market, uh, uh, whatever those are called, pain relievers, you know, indicates we're, we're a society um, in, in trouble. You know, we're not connecting to one another. We're, uh, uh, you know, desperately isolated. We're, uh, uh, our, our division of wealth is getting more extreme. Um, your suicide rates are up. Uh, you know, no, it's not, it's not a healthy moment. You know, we've got 30 or 40 years of topsoil left if we continue to manage it in the way we are. So, yeah, we are, you know, potentially, but I'm thinking rather than trying to put people in a panic about, uh, about that and, and invest in more, you know, bomb shelters and land in New Zealand and Alaska for the, for the coming zombie apocalypse, what I'm trying to do is kind of, you know, rally the troops a bit. I'm trying to uh, uh, paint a picture of how it could actually work out is try to convince people that working together, connecting to others, reestablishing community is not a lost cause, that it's not just for idiots, that, that it's actually a, a higher form of, of living. You know, that, that Ayn Rand and the, the libertarians were wrong. Evolution was not a battle for survival between individuals, but it's the story of increasingly uh, complex modes of collaboration and communication. You know, and when we look at whether it's trees sharing resources with each other in the forest, which goes against the whole myth that the big trees are crowding out the little trees for sunlight, they're actually sharing resources with them constantly, or that, that human beings developed by kind of fighting each other, which we didn't. We developed by learning how to share food and communicate and develop language, um, you know, right through uh, modern culture. So I guess what I'm looking at is how pretty much every invention that we come up with, from speech and text through television and the internet, they can all serve to connect us in new and interesting ways, or if we lose sight of them or lose control of them, they can end up doing the very opposites. And that, that's what, I think that is very much a recurring theme in your book, is that you know, everything that we a a assign duality to, uh, it's a false duality, and what we're really looking for is balance. Uh, and, and, and I think we encounter problems when we get out of balance. It's not that, you know, to be all for the group is the way to be or to be all for the individual is the way to be. You've got to be balancing those forces. And, you know, as, as I listened to your introduction just now, um, you know, talking about this crisis of connectivity, I, I feel like are most people saying to you, well, wait a minute, the, the connectivity that we enjoy now makes us the most in touch with other humans as we've ever been. And I know some people will answer, no, actually they're isolated on their screens, people walking down the street completely oblivious to what's going on around them in person. Uh, but yet that screen can be a tool of connectivity. So it, it seems to be very much about attitude, you know, what attitude we bring to these tools. Yes and no. I mean, the fact is, you're really not connecting to other people on these platforms. These platforms are designed intentionally. This is not conspiracy theory. This is knowledge. This is fact. These are designed intentionally to alienate you from other people. Your, your Facebook news feed, the, 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 uh, the way the various chat platforms work are designed intentionally to alienate you from other people so that you depend on the platforms for a sense of, uh, of, 
of belonging. But you're saying alienate from people in real life because you no, are alienate even from the people on that you're talking to. It's Absolutely. about making you feel bad. All right. So most simply, people are more easily manipulated when they're afraid, when they're alone, when they're alienated. People are more likely to act um, um, reactively and impulsively when you communicate with their brainstem, with the lizard part of their personalities, not with the thinking part. So these platforms- when you're trying to trigger are, fight or flight. Right. right. Okay. To live in that fight or flight state. So these platforms are designed to keep us in that fight or flight state. That's why when we see someone say something on Twitter or on Facebook, we're so likely to go, oh, look at them. They're a racist. They're a sexist or or they're not a racist or they're this. You know, when we see the kid with the MAGA hat on facing off with a Native American in a five second clip, we're compelled to voice our 20 years of anguish about racism in America or anguish about Trump being president and making ourselves look stupid, but getting out that anger, getting out that rage and yelling at someone because the medium is not biased for us to see the human being on the other side. Even as we communicate now, you could say to me, I agree with you. I agree with you. But we can't establish rapport. I can't see if your breathing rate is synced up with mine. I can't see if your pupils are, are opening to take me in. I can't see if your skin is flushing. So my mirror neurons won't activate. I won't know on an organic level that you've become simpatico with me. So the mirror neurons won't go. The oxytocin won't go through my bloodstream. You'll say you agree. We'll get off the connection here. And I'll say, he said he agreed with me but my body didn't feel agreed with. And I'm not going to blame the interface for that. I'm not going to blame, you know, Zoom. I was just looking for either an ally or an enemy of what my own predispositions are. I, this is confirmed, you know, for, for the enemy or confirmed for the ally, I get what I want. And then I ascribe to you feelings and, and aspirations you may not have. Cause I just, right. But that. I'm also going to blame you. I'm going to not trust you. Right. You know, when that, that, Unless I understand, which I do because I've, I've studied the research and I've talked with the people who, who develop the technologies. I've seen BJ Fogg's Keptology Lab at Stanford. I understand that they're taking the algorithms from Las Vegas slot machines and putting them in our news feeds in order to addict us to them. That's the mindset you have is the one arm bandit. Uh, mindset, not a, a scholar, not a Talmudist, certainly, you know, um, but, you know, and even you, you look, though, then you go back. The, 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 and this is why I kind of, uh, uh, for, for me, why I returned to uh, uh, Judaism and, and not returnee, but return um, in, in the 1990s, um, because I thought, well, you know, the Jews really did deal with the, the social and ethical impact of a media revolution. You could look at Judaism as um, sort of a guide for how to transition from an oral culture to a written culture. You know, and as well, you well know, the, the rabbis, many were very upset that we were going to write this thing down because we're not going to be in the same room. We're not going to have a sense of memory. We're going to lose our, our organic connection to our story. So they made rules. They said, well, so let, what about if uh, when you open Torah, you've got to have nine other people around. You have yeah. to have a minion. So you'll have people to disagree. So you'll, you'll, we had to write down rules. To and try you are to commanded to study with a teacher. So there's at least two of you in the room. And you can't go off on your own interpreting what that page means without that at least some guidance. Right. That's and look what happens lies. when we did. Right. You know, and when, when we did, it was the times we went and studied alone was like Isaac Luria, you know, the really intense Kabbalistic, you know, kind of suicidal moments is when people <laughs> study alone in the attic. Right. But um, we're all alone is my point. And when we're online, we are not connected we are we are we are denying ourselves 500,000 years of mechanisms that we develop to establish rapport and cohesion and solidarity right and i love reading what you wrote here and, and obviously you must have done the research on the science to back this up but how important it is uh for for human communities for human groups to mirror right that we pick up someone's mood I mean, with so little information, which is, you know, just a, a slight move of an eyebrow or even just being in the same room, we pick up these atmospherics 
Uh, and it's amazing. And I use that word, atmospherics, which I recently learned is what the Marines use in, uh, in combat profiling. Right? And they're actually trained when they're in a hostile area, in a place where they don't speak the language, they're still able to assess the people around them and look for anomalies. Right? And, 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 when, and it's the, actually the primary indicator, more than language, more than iconography, more than anything, you're taught to ask yourself, what do I feel? You know, mm. coming from these people. And that's in a place where you don't know the culture, you don't know what the Moors are, you, you don't know anything, and yet you can feel what people are feeling around you. It's an amazing thing we have as humans. And I hear what you're saying. When you're interacting with the humans through the screen, the atmospherics are gone. That right. And when the atmospherics are gone, you are a great target. Because <laughs> you're on a certain level, you're defenseless then. And you can be manipulated by the ad. You can be manipulated by the algorithm. I mean, most of the people you know, that you're acting with, interacting with on the internet are not even people. They're what in gaming, gaming we used to call non-player characters. You know, they're robots, right. they're, they're algorithms. And again, the algorithms are not designed to bring out your best self. You know, they're designed to get you to, to buy stuff or to reveal information about yourself so that you can be further manipulated down the line. To cough and, up value. Right. And this is not technology's fault. This is just the way we're using it. This is because we are using these technologies to extract money and data from people. That's what they're for. They're no longer here to help us communicate. And it's funny, you know, when the net was, you know, uh, when it was text only, like, uh, uh, you know, Judaism and Islam, when it was a text, when it was a text only place, it was much harder to do this to people, you know, because we were, we were reading, we were kind of, uh, um, uh, well, it was a lot harder to use, uh, you know, color and shape and and uh, and sort of people capacity. reveal and people reveal themselves in writing in, in a way that they don't in other means. You right. know, like when we look when we think of correspondence, what correspondence mm -hmm. used to mean, you know, Abraham Lincoln would spend half of his time just writing letters, receiving letters, and writing letters, and he really put his soul into those letters. It's not the same when we're two thumbs, you know, we got a smiley face and uh, LOL, you know, and all this. No, stuff. I mean, because we're using a, a medium that's best for like barking commands, you know, mm -hmm. 140 characters or whatever it is. We're using that to try to connect with another person. No, it's, it's biased towards something else. All you can really say is, you know, meet me at, you know, at Joe's pub at 9 p.m. You know, that's really what, what you can do in there. All right, so I want to come back around to what the meaning of these tools is, because I, I, I certainly sense that you're not a Luddite. You're not saying we should put this genie back in the bottle and, and not have these tools. So the question must be how we use them. But before we access that question, um, I'd like to talk about your sense of time, because this is something from the middle of the book, you really talk about, you know, God is a part of your life. God is a part of history. Uh, when, when monotheism came into the world by way of the Jews, the, sen the, you know, the human population sense of time changed from this cyclical sense uh, into one that's more linear. And that also brought positives and negatives. And so the question that I wanna lead to is are these uh, social media tools part of an evolution that's going to a, a positive place or not? Or are they just simply the tools that are around today and, and they're not part of linear history? Um. Well, they're tools that were developed by 18, 19 year old kids in the thrall of venture capitalists who gave them tens of millions of dollars, or in some cases, hundreds of millions of dollars to turn them against us. So while they may have started out as an idea by a 19 year old kid for how to help other college boys find sex partners, you know, which although adolescent is at least pro-social on a certain level, right. um, you know, it's adolescent and it could have slowly developed. And as women came into the company, they might have said, yeah, but, you know, maybe we want to have a slightly more mature understanding of intimacy and we could start building around that. But they were detoured they, before he took his courses in in economics and ethics and anthropology. He was already, you know, Zuckerberg's already listening to the venture capitalists to say, oh, no, 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 no. We're going to pivot this company towards something else. So uh, as these technologies are currently being developed, um, no, they're not, uh, they're not a positive, uh, you know, <laughs> they're not a positive thing. Um, 
but you know they 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 could be it's it's interesting though i mean you know not to get not to get biblical on you but this this is every single thing that we develop tends to get um tends to get turned you know where where you know we develop uh joseph develops debt in in Torah, he develops debt for the Pharaoh, and then oops, it turns into four hundred years of slavery when when it's when it's used kind of inappropriately by well, a first, hard-hearted. And first, it was used to enslave the Egyptians, right? The Egyptians right. sold themselves to Pharaoh uh, so that they could get grain during that drought, right? Uh, so maybe right. that so is where it is. Slavery. Run amok ends right. up, you know. Oops, um, uh, you know, and that and that that kind of keeps uh that keeps happening i mean it's interesting this the the idea of progress it's partly that certainly here in america we have a a forward emphasized understanding of we look forward 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 you know new york you know new jersey new this we're just new and heading west and we keep on going and we kind of have this idea and I understand because it seemed boundless and limitless that you could just keep going. We could just drive fast enough to avoid the exhaust of our own car. Just keep going, keep going. And partly, and I'm not trying to blame that, but part that, that there's an aspect of that forwardness that was born with the with Judeo-Christian uh, understanding of time, that we went from the sort of more in the indigenous religions that all understood time as circular and and religion is circular they understood everything gets reincarnated you don't have your own life you you die and you're reincarnated into someone else right and so, we might have a hundred year storm but otherwise my life as a farmer is pretty much the same as my grandfather's life as a farmer we right. don't have this change in the in the, the, the you know the main issues of society and the main work of society right we're not going anywhere in particular. And right. anything that we do to someone in this life, you're going to see them again. You don't want to screw someone over now because you're going to meet up with them again. You're not just moving forward. You don't just see this person on the road and then keep going. He's going to come back. On, he's going to come back. They're going to come back again and again and again. So with, with – Although by the same token, and if I'm a slave, I'll always be a slave – Right, and if I'm a Cooper, I'll always be a Cooper. Well, you might come back really. in a different life for something else, though. You might come back in a different part of society. Just you're a slave now, and this is your life, but you might have another life where you're something better. You know, right. there was there was that, or something something more fun. Um, but I don't know that there was. Um, you weren't a slave. You weren't striving to get out of slavery, I suppose. So you were, right? You were there. You wonder if you're if you're not beaten. You know, if you're not slavery like uh, American slaves, but you, I wonder what, what the slave's life was or what the experience of that life was when there was no chance of anything else. It's interesting. Was the, uh, was the, the uh, perception of discomfort the same as for a wealthy person today? You know, that's, you know, <laughs> that's a, bigger, a bigger question. Um, you know, if they're not actually being actively, you know, raped and attacked and starved and whatever, you know, if it was just your position in society, then it might not even be uh, so bad. But that's, that's another point. Um, okay. the, the point I'm trying to make is that once we had text and we could write things down, that's when we got history, that's when we got a future. We could write down what happened, we could, we could say where we're at now, and we could write contracts for the future. And the Torah could be understood as a covenant, as a contract with God. You do this, he did, he'll do this, and Abraham's going to get his land back by the end. You know, it's this kind of promise. And once we had that, then we can have monotheism. Because before then, how could there be one God if the world has so many problems? You know, once you had the invention of time, then you could justify monotheism because you could say, well, there's one God, but he's not done yet. You know, creation's not done yet. And sometime and way we have the, a role to play. And we right. have a role to play in that creation. Right. And Very the positive. great part about that, yeah. And that's the beautiful part about the Judeo-Christian line is we are making the world better. Exactly. Tikkun olam. With every year, are we getting better? What are the metrics we're going to use? Are people feeling better? Are they, I mean, not the ones we use today, like GDP, you know, which is how well the corporations are doing. But, but this idea of progress was beautiful on a certain level, but it has to be balanced with, you know, with, with retrieving values and seeing where we're coming from. You can't just make it an ends justifies the means journey. So America still is not really 
adequately addressed or even uh, uh, digested slavery, what we just did a century or two ago, you know, that their people's grandparents still remember, you know, remember slaves. So it's like, if, if we haven't dealt with that, then what happens is, well, we start writing movies about uh, uh, robot slaves having revolutions against us. As I see it, that's just a projection of our guilt about, about the past. So, and it's part of what's letting us, uh, uh, driving us off this cliff that we think just pedal to the metal, keep going, keep going. And we just refuse to retrieve the values that we're leaving behind. You know, whether it's, it, it's community and the, the sort of the, what seem like uh, obsolescent uh, uh, human values are actually essential ones. Just today, uh, so at Accidental Talmudist, we've always called, uh, you know, what we do in our page and, and the people who follow it, we call it a community very actively and all the time. We talk about our community. And, uh, and we've definitely gotten to know members of that community who are really active and who we feel like they're our friends, even though we've never met them in person. And just today, one of the members of our community who's just reached a place where she's so ill that, I mean, she could die, she's dying. And, 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 and so this is very much a, you know, a faith community and we put out a call for prayer. Uh, for her and and you know hundreds of people are responding and people are praying for her right now someone that they've never met now this seems like a great positive a positive use of the social media tool it it, it would be better if we were all you know in Michigan and we could go visit her yeah. but we can't do that no and what you're talking about is the way we used to use the internet in the late 80s and early 90s that's what it was like all the time all the time, you know, on, on networks like The Well, which was one of the first uh, online sort of community boards. It was. People used to have this, um, this word beams, you know, B-E-A-M-Z. So when someone was feeling bad, you know, you would just put in that thing, oh, beams, which means I'm, I'm sending you, uh, you know, my, my healing love energy okay. and my love, my sympathy. Um, and a lot of times it could organize real support. Someone's in distress in Austin. Who's in Austin? Who can get there? Who do we know? Um, now there's GoFundMes for people, you know, who've reached a terrible impasse in their life and people want to literally help with some money and, and that. Well, or, or symbolically help with money. Yeah. Or symbolically. <laughs> and of course that invites fraud. And then, and then people make up these stories and try to collect on people's sympathy. And that's because they're random, right? It's not right. actually your community at that point. It's your, and that's the thing. You're seeing a tweet from something that looks convincing, like a, just like a Nigerian email. Oh, child, you know, dying of cancer, please give money because otherwise the chemo is going to be pulled out of his arm in 20 minutes. Oh, quick, everybody, you know, start sending. And it's like, that to me is evidence of both people's innate goodwill and their lack of community context because they don't have a community through which to negotiate that. So you establish a certain level of trust. The community is like your living room. The people are there. They've been talking. They're engaged. And they're, 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 you guys, uh, uh, in some ways, try to compensate for the uh, anonymity of this space by having certain things that a person needs to do in order to become a real member of this community. Okay, so let's just say for a moment that you were enslaved, you were forced into this job. You'd never take it, I'm sure, <laughs> if it was offered to you, but you were forced to be the U.S. social media czar. What rules would you impose to, to try to alleviate? Uh, oh, know, if I really got to be it, I would do it. Um, I would turn Facebook into a public utility. And so how would that be different? Well, now the object of Facebook would no longer be to try to extract as much money and data from you as they can. The objective of Facebook wouldn't be to design algorithms to try to get you to behave against your own best interests. We would stop all that because we, the, the object wouldn't be to deliver cash to shareholders. Okay, so Instead, the profit model is what would change, right? Right. And okay. once the profit model has changed, then we could change what we're programming it for. So this is like a tool. It's like a hammer. And we could say, okay, we're going to use this hammer to help people smash their faces. Because the more they smash their face with the hammer, the more they're going to have to pay for plastic surgery to repair their face. That's our model. And I would say, oh, no, no, no. What about if we teach people how to use a hammer to like build stuff? 
It's like such a more appropriate use of that hammer. So here I would say social media networks, okay, we can use it to make girls feel bad about their bodies, to make um, men feel more lonely, so they use more porn. Um, women feel less attractive, so they buy more stuff. Um, and everybody become more predictable so that we can make more money betting on their future behaviors. And we could say, no, 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 you know, what if? instead of intentionally creating a platform that leads us to see other people as adversaries, mm -hmm. what if we created a platform that helped people see their adversaries as other human beings? Just as easy. It's just as easy to do. So, for, so what would that take? For example, what would, it, what would it take to do that, to see them as human beings? Well, I mean, partly it would mean we, we, we would, first we would stop using all of the tools that we use to uh, throw people into their reptile brain. So we wouldn't be, be trying to uh, uh, throw all of this kind of car crash like imagery at them. We would have a platform where you can't just, you can't make money by having people just click on something because they're afraid of it. You know, right now that's how Facebook makes money. So any little, you know, Eastern European hacker can come in with a picture of, you know, Hillary Clinton in a Nazi outfit or something and people click on it or lefties retweet it because they've been so outraged by it. And that company makes money that way. And Facebook makes money that way. So what if, that's not how the company makes its money, or it doesn't even care now because it's a public utility. So, so now- it's not about censoring the content, but changing the motivation. Right, so right. that now it's not a platform that's designed to get people to click no matter what. It's a platform that's designed to have people actually um, interact with each other. So what if we took the algorithms off people's news feeds? So the way Facebook used to work before it was quite as evil as it is, is you would, subscribe to different people's pages, all the yeah. different people, and then the things that they post end up in your news feed. Right, which you curated. Right. And when they changed it about like a year and a half ago, I mean, that hurt so many people who had built followings. It was terrible. Well, they changed it, they've changed yeah. it a few times along the way. The first right. real bad change was around 2011. But yeah, once they started using algorithms to do that, now they're not trying to show you what you've asked to see. They're right. trying to show you what they can get you to click on and what's going to help them know, learn more about what you will automatically click on. So it's a training platform. It's like a Pavlovian dog whistle training uh, 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 platform. And there's books that, they, that they've written about how to do this, that the engineers read while they're being trained. There's courses they take in how to do this. There's departments in, in what this is about. They're taking, you know, what we know about behavioral economics, you know, Freudian psychology and Pavlovian reflexes, neurolinguistic programming, sales, and, and leveraging it teaching it to algorithms and then having algorithms try thing after thing after thing after thing after thing on us until they see what works. If you take all that away, first the platform becomes so much easier to use, you know, right. and really it becomes a little bit more like, I mean, Twitter, which I still like better because Twitter still works where you get mostly the stuff that you've asked to see. Although now they're, they're sort of dropping more ads and things in there because again, the $2 billion a year they make turns out not to be enough. You know, they have to grow. And so, I do still get emails that someone famous tweeted and I'm not following them, but they're still saying it to me. Right, recommended for you or something, yeah. Right, so, okay, but realistically, they're not gonna do it themselves, that's for sure. Uh, and they're, they're gonna fight so hard that probably the government isn't gonna step in and create the kind of regulation that you're talking about. So- Well, I, our government like, won't. I mean, in Europe, they are looking at regulating because they still have working government there. Do you think that European government is working better than American government? Oh yeah, at this? Yeah. At this. The right well, to be forgotten, the privacy thing, that I accept cookies, all those things that are on websites now are because of European uh, uh, regulation. And now <laughs> Europe is seriously considering shutting down Facebook there because Facebook is such a bad actor because they lie about what they're doing. You know, they're, they, they, and then when they, when they get caught lying about what they're doing, what do they do? 
they start putting out bad publicity about George Soros. I mean, who does it? That's called anti-Semitism. That's the, that's the, the root cause of anti-Semitism. We got caught doing something. Oh, look at those Jews over there. I mean, always an easy distraction. Yeah. Don't, don't look at the wizard over there you know, behind <laughs> the curtain. Um, but, but it seems to me like the problem is, you know, yesterday, uh, I mean, over Shabbos, actually, I was reading this, uh, this old pamphlet. It's a pamphlet of a tape that Avigdor Miller made in the 80s, you know, and he was talking then uh, about how the media was just advocating socialism uh, in a dangerous way. I mean, socialism as a kind of tyranny of ideologues uh, who are just convinced that they're virtuous and want to bring a good to society, uh, but will, you know, do anything they need to do to put their version of good into place. I mean, that's what the, the Bolshevik revolution was about and it brought communist Soviet Union into being and that was not a good. It was intended to be a good, but it never worked out that way. So we must be very careful when we turn over the reins of power to well-intentioned people with big ideas. But that's why we don't turn over reins of power to anybody. You know, that's why we have to return to a local reality. We are fooling ourselves if we think that politics is about who we elect president of the United States. That has about as much impact on you as who you pick for American Idol. And most people engage in politics that way. <laughs> that's American Idol. Is They were raised with American Idol as their understanding of democracy. No, democracy happens at your local school board. It happens... 90% of it happens locally and can trickle up to them. So I'm not asking for state-sponsored socialism where we use taxes to redistribute the spoils of capitalism after the fact. I'm talking about uh, uh, really distributism, where we pre-distribute the means of production before the fact, where we have worker-owned companies and small businesses and, and worker-owned factories that are um, networked and, and, and sharing and developing from the bottom up. And that so much more of what we do could be happening that way. And you can really look at the history of business as the process through which it's become impossible for small businesses to add or create value. You know, the, the development of the automobile over the last 30 years is to make them unserviceable by mechanics you know you got to take it <laughs> to the to the branded corporate shop because they've got the proprietary algorithm to analyze your system and it's like just give me points and plugs please you know i i i knew i used to know how to fix my car and it's not to say um, oh, I just want things back the way they were. I understand we can have technological development, but we're doing technological development uh, uh, with, this, with this stated purpose of making it harder for anybody to participate in the value chain. And by returning businesses to, to employee hands, by having, say, I mean, you could call it socialism, I guess, but it's not. What if the Uber drivers owned Uber? What would that be? So they're still basically driving cars in order to teach their robot replacements. That's what Uber is, right? Uber mm -hmm. monitors the drivers because it's teaching its algorithms how to drive based on what the drivers are doing. And it lets the drivers have an unlivable wage in return for supplying their car and their time and everything else to do that machine learning. If Uber were owned by the drivers, then even if they're training their own replacements, they're going to own the company that they've built, that they've, that they've built with their research and development. And that's, those are pretty easy to think of, you know, and, and we're seeing tons of worker owned companies. But the, but the centralized, centrally owned company will be able to undercut the, the more broadly owned company every time, right? Because it's, it's just going to be more directed be, because if the human capital is more expendable, they can give a cheaper product. You would think so, but actually um, they do worse. And the reason they do worse is because they've got to take 90% of their um, profits and deliver it to shareholders. So in America now, there's a company called Winco, which is going head to hand against Walmart. Okay. And they're basically the same sort of company, except Winco is owned by the employees. And because it's owned by the employees, they don't want to do terrible things to the communities in which they live. So they don't um, attack local merchants. You know, they don't um, uh, pollute. They don't give unlivable wages and put more burden on the welfare, uh, on welfare programs. They don't have workers on food stamps. And 
They're actually beating Walmart in every place they're going head to head. And a Walmart investor was asking me, how could this be? They pay their workers more. They have the same prices. They treat the community better. How could they be beating us? And it's like, because they don't have to pay you. Because, you know, there's all of these millions of rich people sitting there wanting to passively earn uh, growth and, and income based on the work of other people. And their investment wasn't even real. They bought a stock. They didn't invest in Walmart. But they didn't give operating capital to a company to grow. They just bought a, a coupon and expect that that means what? What did you so, do? So, so what makes Winco work is that there's people willing to invest the time to organize it and not be compensated at, at, at huge levels, right? They're, they're going to be the, essentially like the owners, but they're the operators without taking that huge windfall. Right. And even the it. ones who do, they're happy to be multimillionaires. But not you know, billionaires. I, Is that the right. idea? That's when I talk to uh, young developers and about their valuation and how much money they're going to take. And I'll ask them, like, well, first, do you like the thing you're, do you like the product you're doing? Do you like this thing? You know, so do you want to actually do it or are you just making it a company in order to sell it? And mm-hmm. if they like the thing, if they have any sense of purpose, if they think, yeah, this app could actually help people, I like my app, then I say, well, are you satisfied making tens of millions? instead of billions. If you, if, if you could only come out of this with 50 or $60 million for making this app, I know it's, it's a compromise. <laughs> could, you, could you live with that? Could you live with that? And could you live with the high probability of making tens of millions of dollars rather than a low probability of making billions? But and they usually, all answer yes, right? They must all most say yes. Of them do say yes. And once they have once they have an adult who understands the landscape telling them how this works, they go, okay, Sequoia Capital, I don't want a five hundred million dollar valuation. I want a smaller valuation so I don't have to pay back as much money to the investors and I can actually keep this app doing something that I want it to do mm-hmm. rather than something bad. And then all of their libertarian friends will say, what's your problem? Social justice warrior? You know, are you some kind of a, you know, a, a, a Black Lives Matter person or something? You're sacrificing your, your billions to some social justice? It's like, Geez, no, we're talking about living in scale, the way that multimillionaires used to do things. You know, and that's you can even say, no, I'm a capitalist and I want the company to survive and keep paying me. And if I sell right. out looking for that bigger number, I actually might destroy the company. Right. But they don't really care as long as they get out. It's more of a pyramid scheme. As long as you get out of the company before it crashes, it doesn't matter. So, you know, you take like a, a, there was a, what was that game called? Draw something or draw this? You know, it was so funny. It was seen as the ideal example because they sold themselves to another game company for like a zillion dollars on the day their subscriptions peaked. The day after they sold is when it started to go down. And it was always joked about, yeah, you perfect timing, dude, um, because they, their company was over. It's just like, I mean, and this was the, the story I was telling in 1999 when um, AOL bought Time Warner. And I wrote this op-ed, the Times, New York Times asked me to write the op-ed because, I mean, me, because there was nobody writing about tech that early. There was very few of us. And so they wanted me, and I'm not a business guy, to write the story about what does it mean? And I said, well, what this means is that AOL is over. They're, buy, they're, they're cashing in their chips and buying a real company like Time Warner. That this means AOL has peaked in their subscriptions. I'm sure of it. And the Times, they wouldn't publish it. They said, this guy's you're crazy. You sound like a communist or something. What are you saying? If AOL is buying Time Warner, there's synergies. This is the future. And of course, I turned out to be right. AOL, that was when they had just peaked, when their subscriptions were falling off, as we found in later documents. And they nearly killed, I think they kind of did, killed um, Time Warner. And they certainly, you know, killed themselves at the same time. Um, it, was a, it was an utter failure. And, uh, and, and that's, that's the phenomenon we're looking at. And people use them as the example of what to do. You get to the peak and then buy something real or cash out right before it falls. And I'm suggesting, no, there's actually, I mean, talk about the forward looking progress oriented thing. It's progress to the top of the hill and then boom, you know, but you know, we don't, we don't, I don't even. Okay. But these are principles that you could put in place perhaps as the social media czar. But now you're just Douglas Rushkoff. You wake up. What time do you get up? Uh, 6.30. 
6.30. So you get up at 6.30 and you're a member of Team Human. So how is that different than when I get up at 6.30 and I haven't read your book? Like, you know what I mean? Like, what, how do you put these principles into everybody's practice as an individual? You know, I mean, that's the number one thing. Everybody's different. So there's no industrial age solutions that one size fits all solutions. People live in different places with different kind of people. You know, some people, you know, get up and kiss their wife. Other people get up and kiss their dog, you know, um, and, and God bless us all. Mm-hmm. Um, but for me, I mean, I'm not on Facebook. I don't see that as Luddite. I use a heck of a lot of technology, but I tend not to use technologies that make me feel bad. I try not to use technologies that I know are doing really nasty things to me. Um, You know, for me, I, I, uh, I try not to live at scale. I'm trying to live um, within my means, meaning not just, you know, uh, financially, but, but socially, and even, you know, my podcast or something, I've got 20, 25,000 people who listen to it. I'm not asking myself or talking to my producers at, at every weekly meeting saying, how are we going to grow our listenership? How are we going to grow? It's like, what if 25,000 is the number of people who really should be listening to this at any given time, you know, and let it happen organically. And if it grows, it grows. If it doesn't, it doesn't. Um, that's all fine. I, uh, uh, so it sounds like the first principle is greed is not good. Right? Yeah. And find the right size for what you're doing. And mm-hmm. don't believe that if the whole world doesn't know what you're doing, if you haven't gotten a million likes, if you haven't gotten all over the place, that it doesn't matter. You know, what you do in your world matters, you know, and it actually matters more. If you're, you know, teaching, you know, three adults a year how to read, who don't know how to read, and there's great programs for that, you know, adult literacy training when you're teaching grownups how to read. Mm -hmm. I mean, you've changed life pretty friggin' profoundly, right? Yeah. So what do you want to do? Teach three adults a year to read or get 3 million people to retweet something that you found the clever tweet that finally 3 million people retweeted it. Yay. I mean, there's two different ways of having impact, I guess. But think about what you actually want to do and what has, what has real uh, meaning for you. Um, for me, it's a matter of learning to look in other people's eyes. I walk around feeling like I'm part of a conspiracy, you know, and conspiracy literally to conspire just means to breathe together. You know, 10 people sitting in a room are a conspiracy, certainly in the current landscape, because if you're just sitting in a a room enjoying other people, you're not buying anything, you're not selling anything, you're not providing any data to anybody, you're not clicking on anything, you are an enemy of the economy at that point. You're an enemy of the state. You're a communist. You're 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 not consuming. How long are you going to be in this room together? Because you're not consuming and we need you out. <laughs> exactly. You're just playing cards. It's like, you know, you have to retire in order to be allowed to play cards anymore. You know, and, and what I'm trying to do is in, in as real a way as I can, you know, celebrate, you know, what Mr. Rogers used to tell me, that I'm special just the way I am, that human beings are valuable not for their utility value, but for their essential value. And this is where it gets Jewish or even Aristotelian, you know, that, I believe that, that we have souls. And even if we don't have souls, you know, we have soul. <laughs> it's an right. easier concept. People are, well, are less threatened by that idea. We have soul. And soul feels good. And soul can be shared and grown and spread. But it means that we have intrinsic value, that we have intrinsic dignity as humans, that you don't need to earn your place as a human to, to deserve to be here. You know, and, and when you start with that and start engaging with people uh, uh, from the, from, uh, with, with, a, with a supposition of their dignity as humans, it kind of starts to change everything. And, and so it's more, uh, I, I'm thinking more about my choices and how I move through the world um, in response to those sorts of sensibilities rather than, okay, I get up, I don't do email until I've peed and eaten. Um, I mean, I have problems with email. That's a big problem for me. I get close to a thousand emails a day. And I often think if just 1% of the people who emailed me bought my books, 
<laughs> then you could be a, a 10 millionaire at scale. <laughs> it or would something. be good. <laughs> at least a 100,000 air at scale. Um, but it, it is funny, you know, and, and I'm trying not to be angry at people, but I'll get so many emails saying, oh, I heard about your, um, you know, book Team Human, uh, or I saw your... Um, I saw the interview you did about Team Human. Tell me, um, what does your book say about this? Or what does your book say about that? Or where could I find more on what you were talking about? Uh, it's like, dude, just buy my friggin' book already. You know, it's like, or, you know, it's not, not as bad as, and I do get them. I get emails from high school students saying, uh, my teacher assigned your book, Media Virus, for me to read in class. Please tell me what it's about. So I don't have to read it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Can you please summarize it for me in less than a thousand words. Oh. No, I can't. <laughs> I, I think that we all do have souls. Uh, I think that as we walk around, if you, instead of seeing that guy looks like he smells and that guy looks like he would never listen to the music that I listen to. And, and that girl looks like uh, she's hot. I, I want to go talk to her. Yeah but rather soul, 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 soul. Right. And, and so then the greeting, right? I mean, our sages teach, greet every person with a cheerful countenance, right? With a cheerful face, a smile for people. Uh, and when they say, how you doing? You, you answer, right? I, I've taken to, as, as, whenever I remember, and I remember more and more, when somebody says to me, how you doing? I say, I'm grateful. It stops them in their tracks because how you doing has just become, you know, nothing. It's, it's just nonsense that we issue as we walk right. by each other. Uh, but if you actually answer the question and you talk about gratitude, people will stop. They'll be like, oh, I I'm on an island. Th th this is a different person in front of me. Let's have a conversation. And it changes everything. Yeah. No, it's yeah. beautiful. And that it's would beautiful. seem to be a team human principle, right? That oh, should fit totally. in. Totally. I mean, for me, the conspiracy is just walking around in New York and looking for people who aren't on their phones. And then you make <laughs> eye contact with one. Even if I don't say anything, it's almost like, oh, there's another. Hey, I see you. You see me. Aren't they all crazy? Yep, they are. And then we keep going. You know, it's just that wink of like, oh, there's another living. Yeah, living I, I, I used to live in Manhattan uh, and would take the subway to work, but I, I left well, 25 years ago. Now when I go back and visit, I mean, every single person on the train is on the phone. Yeah. And I was amazed because I'm like, the phones work in the, in the tunnels? Yes, New York made that happen. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's partly, well, partly they're just doing their, their, their games and things. I mean, and, it, and I try to be tolerant of that too, because then I realize, okay, sitting in a subway car, pressed into all these people who are smelly is a a pretty supreme act of collaboration in itself. So if people need to look in their little screens in order not to be overwhelmed by, you know, the crushing, you know, people and around it's, them. It's not so much worse than reading a book. I mean, we, we respect right. that they're reading a book. Them, right? But go on the Metro in Paris. It's like, it took me so long to get used to it. People like are looking at you and checking you out, making eye contact, or you like, they look at you through a reflection. There was this one woman who was looking at me through her in the reflection in the window. She was looking and then I looked at her and it was like, oh, and you are thinking, oh my God, is everybody on the make? Is this like, you know, some kind of a, a transportational Tinder, you know, going on here? And it's not, it's just a flirtatious society. They're just appreciating the kind of their aliveness and the social space that we're all we're in this car together, ooh, you know? It was just so uh, uh, embodied that uh, I was thinking, wow, I wonder if we could do that in, uh, in New York. And not be prey, and with an E, P-R-E-Y. Uh, and I say that, I mentioned that combat profiling before. I've actually yeah. been doing some training, you know, because synagogues, especially small synagogues, the Ugh. bigger synagogues can afford an armed guard. The smaller synagogues can't. And so, you know, we congregants have to get a little bit trained about where dangers lie. And something that they taught us is, you know, there's this four color scale, condition white, yellow, orange, red, right? So condition white is what all these people are walking around in. It means you're oblivious to your surroundings. You don't know what's going on around you. And should danger erupt, should there be an earthquake, should there be a terrorist, should anything happen, you'll be the last to know. 
Yellow is relaxed alertness. It means what you're talking about on the Metro in Paris. You're looking around. You want to know who's around you, who's near, what's going on. And, and, and not tense, not paranoid, but you're just scanning for anomalies, right? And so then if you see something that makes you uncomfortable, that's orange. And now you have to decide, is it really dangerous? You go to condition red. Or no, it's not dangerous. Go back to yellow. But once you become aware of this sort of system of looking at people, like for instance, my teenage daughter is in condition white all the time. I mean, because she's got to be communicating with her girlfriends, you know, and, and they use so for them, social media is not, you know, disembodied strangers across the country. It's com continuous contact with the friend group and they all have to know what each other's doing all the time. But they're not aware of what's happening in the room where they're sitting or the car that they're riding in. Right. And so, I mean, we've just made it a rule. No, you cannot be on the phone when you're in the car with us. <laughs> and, and thank God for Shabbos, because at least they know one day a week that it's possible to be completely disconnected from this. Stuff. Right. I mean, that's why we invented it, you know? Shabbos. But, yeah, the recovering, yeah. <laughs> the recovering death cult addicts in the, in the desert, you know, said, look, we're going to need one day off. Or we can get addicted to, to work, to, to, to money, to whatever. We need one day, again, Mr. Roger, one day to celebrate that you are sacred just the way you are. I mean, I know that God is sacred and all that, but it was also a way of saying human beings deserve 24 hours just to celebrate their dignity. You yes. Know? yes, yes. Just and to that, celebrate their and that you were created for a reason. And are, do you know what the reason is that you were created? And, and most of us will say, uh, I'm not sure. Good. So one day a week, send the periscope up and, and look around. Like, you know, if, where do I sit? What, what am I trying to do? What, what are my goals? If you never stop, th then you're in that mindless treadmill chase of you, who knows what, but you never thought, oh, maybe I'm on the wrong treadmill. You know, maybe I need right. to get on that treadmill over there. It's funny. Where is it? Where is it in? And I'm not that I'm putting you on the spot, but you might know because the word Talmud's behind you. Where is it in Talmud where they say that the reason to uh, 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 study Torah is lishma for its own sake? I mean, we say it in the prayer book every day that that that, that we should rise to the level where we're learning just for its own sake and not to make it a crown for ourselves or, or something like that. So that's like a medieval uh, notion, medieval prayer that got written or something. In the in the Siddur. I, I'm sure it's earlier. I'm sure it is early. I mean, I, I mean, the Siddur is early, like that around two, between two and 500, it's coming oh, it together. Is. Yeah. Uh, and, and parts of it, even Second Temple period. So I, I think that's very early, the idea that is we that should learn so, for learning. That to sake. me is such a profound, uh, profound idea. You know, that once you're doing something for its own sake, that just breaks capitalism right in half, you know? It's like, what do, what, what do you mean for its own sake? Yeah, I'm just doing this. You know, I'm just, you know, so because the way I had learned, I, I had heard it was that there was a, um, you know, one of the letters going to one of those rabbinic committees and someone was, was, was asking, are we reading Torah, you know, in order to be more ethical people or in order to remember our history as of the Israelites and that the rabbis argued and then said, no, you just, neither. It's really shma. You just read Torah to read Torah. And, um, Evo, whether it's a, I mean, all, well, all, all, uh, all, all Divar Torah is real, right? <laughs> right. So it counts. But, it, but it, well, you know, I just read this account over the weekend. It, 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 it's still sitting with me now. It's so interesting when you think the, the Jews who received Torah and, and, and then within such a short time built a golden calf, right? Like, how could they do that? It's the greatest mystery of all. It, it's not right. like it was remote in history for them. They saw the 10 miracles that got them out of Egypt. They, they walked through the, the parted Red Sea, you know, and, and, then, and then God himself made a manifestation that, that was, there's God, you know, and he's talking to us and we hear his voice. And so quickly they made that golden cabin. How is that possible? And one explanation is, who were these people? The Jews were the descendants of Abraham and Abraham was not chosen until he figured out monotheism on his own. In other words, he figured out that there was one God who created the world with his own sechel, his own reasoning. And then God said, okay, you are like, mm. you, I can, you I can work with. And then he passed on those immense powers of reasoning. And remember, that means that he and his people didn't buy into 
the mesmerizing cults that every other nation had. You know, you have to kill children to propitiate right. the rain god, and you have to bring this and that. And they're like, we don't buy those stories. We are total skeptics with a, a, a hyper-developed truth sense, right? And, and, then they, and then they were, they were very grateful that they'd been taken out of Egypt. Uh, and then they said, and, and so we will do and we will hear. We will accept Torah and we'll accept all these laws. And then the laws start coming down. And they get, I will not murder, makes sense. I will not steal, makes sense. I will not bear false witness, makes sense. I can't eat a cheeseburger? Why can't I eat a cheeseburger? What's wrong with the cheeseburger? Everybody else around me is eating a cheeseburger, you know? And so there's all these laws that are because God said so. And that was very difficult for them to accept. Mm. And so then what they start doing is, is finding the ways to make it work both ways, right? And so what they, the golden calf was, what they were saying was, no, idols, they do work. It's just, they're not gods. They're tools of God. So now we can have idols, even though the Torah says don't have idols, because we understand that it's just an intermediary that's going to replace Moses. It's not going to be a God. It's just going to replace Moses. Right. And this is where, this is the problem. We can reason ourselves into anything. And that's why we need you know, an external source of timeless laws. And it's very difficult to submit to that. You know, that's what Torah is all about. And, and for the, the, the hyper rational being, they're like, no, 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 no. I'm not going to submit my reason to anything. It's, It's very difficult, very challenging. And, and I, and I raise that now because now we're, we're looking at your book and we're looking at, uh, you know, how do we set up systems that work? We know we want to be motivated by kindness. We want to be motivated by intelligence, by research to see what works. Uh, but we can still create a dangerous, ideologically motivated, you know, u- d- utopia that turns into a dystopia. And I, wh- what I get from reading your book is, well, we can avoid that fate if we keep testing, you know, the, the, the stuff that we build. We keep asking, wait a minute, is this promoting good or not? Uh, and is it in keeping, for me, I mean, as a believer, for me, I think the source of morality is God. Now, I know that, you know, the non-believer is going to look somewhere else uh, for the source of morality. But what I don't like is that morality is relative and that mm-hmm. everyone has their own truth. I, you know, it may not be easy to discover an eternal truth, but I believe that it exists. Right. And so then we have to ask ourselves, what are those eternal principles and are we consonant with them? What do you think about that? Yeah, I mean, it's. We're at an even more beginning stage than that at this point. I mean, I'm really trying to help the people in my world you know, who are largely like, you know, technology enthusiasts and developers, um, social activists, uh, uh, you know, it's a pretty, it's a, it's a somewhat narrow bandwidth of, of society. Um, I'm trying to help them understand that we can't just keep pushing in the same direction with the same tools in the same way, but we've got to retrieve a lot of the tools and mechanisms and things that we left behind, okay. you know, and we left behind really kind of around the time of the last Renaissance, you know, in, in, in medieval times when, when women and, and uh, localism and peer to peer economics and local currencies and, and all these sort of uh, hands on, approaches to the world were left behind and we've got to kind of retrieve some of them and uh but was it really better i I mean no it's not we don't go back but it's not that it was better it's that we don't want to leave behind everything was it Ah. better when was it better when people read torah all the time no it wasn't but would it be good if a few more people knew what torah was now Maybe. I mean, was it, you know, so no, I'm not saying it was better in, in Game of Thrones era, you know, <laughs> whatever. But, but there are some principles getting, we can, we, that we know work and that we've abandoned right, that we could I'm bring thinking, back. Right. But it was, right. but it was an awful shame that the monarchs made small business illegal and forced everybody to work for a chartered monopoly. Uh, you know, and, and we could retrieve small business. It was a shame that they replaced by force of sword 
um, local currencies and means of exchange with centralized interest bearing currencies, which then created an economy that must grow in order to stay still. That's a problem. We can't keep growing our economy, and we don't need to. It's not an economic law. That's a law of a very particular currency developed by a small group of monarchs in the 11th and 12th century in order to pre prevent the rise of the middle class. So I think we can go back and retrieve some, uh, uh, some sort of uh, medieval, really medieval sensibility. The commons, which was- The commons, exactly, which were enclosed in England. Yeah. The devastating you know, effect for the farmers. Exactly, devastating. devastating. Right. And and then now we buy the myth of the the that the col that the commons doesn't work, the tragedy of the commons, which isn't true at all. You know, the commons is actually better governed than corporate owned land. It's actually governed by committee, and there's you know strict penalties for for abusing a commons. And, and just so people know what we're talking about, so you know there would be the large landowners, but there were areas. Uh, that they could not control, where people could uh, pasture their sheep, right? And uh, where they could have community gardens, essentially, uh, and where they would live rent-free. I mean, they could have a house in that area as well. Uh, but then when the landowners needed to, you know, finance ships or other large-scale projects like that, and the East India Tea Company, et cetera, then they needed to suck as much value out of the land as possible, and then they had to assert, you know, one person owns this land and everyone pays him rent. And that was yeah. the beginning of a big change over there. Yeah, and, and the church owned a lot of commons too, mm -hmm. you know, but those got taken away when, uh, you know, in the Protestant Reformation as well. And so, so I mean, yeah, there was a few, a, a few, but yeah, but, but and commonsing is on the rise again, you know, because commonsing is sort of a form of cooperative, uh, cooperative enterprise. It's like, oh, this is our town's field. What do we want to do with it? Okay, Joe can graze his, you know, you can graze on it, but you can only graze on it two days a week because we've got to keep it. Or we've got an aquifer that we're all depending on for our water. How much can we pull out of this aquifer before it's gone? You know, so we're going to have to manage yeah. this together. And now what makes, I, I really agree with you, we need to do these kinds of things. And what I think stops it from happening is that we have to sit through meetings. <laughs> where everyone's going to talk right. and where rules are going to be laid out. And our attention span has become so short that people are like, ah, I'm not going to sit through right. that long and meeting. Let somebody else do the these, rules. <laughs> and we've bought the idea. Oh, and I got to, I got to run to my family now. Um, it's, it's five is my, my, my out. Oh, okay. But, um, but we buy the illusion that only losers go to those meetings. That if you're successful, you've got money, you've got your own house, you've got your own guards, you've got private property, and screw it. I don't care what happens in that little town. And only losers are going to go to a school board meeting or a local zoning meeting. I mean, right. and you go to one of those meetings and they are. There's like three crazy people in the back. But that's where we should actually be going to, take re to re retake uh, charge of our world. It's the real world that's been left behind and that we, it, it, it's, it's here for the taking. Civics. We need civics, old yeah. fashioned civics and willingness to invest time and energy into it. Douglas, I want to thank you very much for coming on the Accidental Talmudist podcast. It's been a really, uh, you know, inspiring and, and, and spirited conversation with you. I wish you the best of luck with Team Human and, uh, you know, may it change towns and may it change online societies. And may we all, you know, hook into this, uh, this human organism that we're a part of and that we add to as individuals. Oh, I s certainly hope so. Thank you. All right, all the best. All right, you be good.